southeastern uh, Indiana County. Uh, it's located right along the Connemaw River, which makes up the south southern boundary of Indiana County. I'm sorry, I'm just getting things situated here. There we go. West Wheatfield Township is uh, about 31 square miles in size, and uh, it's located between uh, Blacklick Creek to the north and the Connemaw River to the south, and between Chestnut, Chestnut Ridge to the west and Laurel Ridge to the east. Uh, the major uh, town in, in the township is Robinson. Um, there are some other towns which I think would probably better be classified as ghost towns, uh, Climax, India, uh, Germany, Heshpen. Um, you know, they, they all have you know, a few houses left, but um, not a whole lot um, are, is remaining in their community. And actually there is a trail uh, that comes along Blacklick Creek to the north here that's called the Ghost Town Trail. There is also a large uh, State Game Lands uh, 163 is located in the southwest corner of the township. So like I said before, the biggest town is, is Robinson. It's located right on the Connemaw River, and it's located next to uh, Pack Saddle Gap, which is the gorge that cuts through Chestnut Ridge. And it was once a, a prosperous town with uh, quite a few different mines and brick plants. Um, you know, most of the industry is closed down at this point, and you know, along with that, the jobs and yeah, as a result, you know, the, the area has a, a high poverty rate. And, you know, the township su supervisors are uh, hoping that increasing the recreational opportunities of the area will also mean uh, more job op op opportunities for the local residents. So after my initial meeting with the township, uh, supervisors, they gave me a quick tour of the area. Uh, to the east of Robinson, this is the edge of the town of Robinson right here, um, there is a large um, active treatment plant that's treating uh, discharge from a, a very large coal mine. Uh, it, you know, it's the responsibility of, of the mining company to um, you know, keep the, the water treated. So you know, that's not a concern. Um, you know, during this uh, assessment. Um, there's also a very large coal refuse pile that's nicely eroding into the Panama River. And you can also see this uh, plume of orange here. And at first I thought, boy, that active treatment plant is not really doing well treating the water. Um, but it's actually from an abandoned source, um, you know, way up the, the stream here. This is Richard's run. So the, there, here's some pictures of, of the streams that flow through the town. This is Richard's Run, you know, where you know, that uh, mine drainage is coming down and joining the Connemaw here. And then this is a non-named tributary that, that's even worse quality. And you can see this is right in people's backyards. So as I started to do my research, I discovered that the township has been very heavily mined. Yeah. Uh, I found this map of Indiana County that is fairly comprehensive and shows the, the number of, or the, the amount of mining, the underground mining in the area. And I counted a total of 17 different underground mines in the township. And some of these were, were really large mines because right here in the corner, there's actually a power plant. And so these mines would just, you know, they basically come out of the hillside and feed the, the, the power plant. In addition to the underground mining, there is about uh, 7.6 square miles of, of surface mining that went on, and there's a total of 42 uh, different surface mines. So just you know, eyeballing it, you know, I'd say about three quarters of the of the township is, has been mined. So there, there hasn't been a whole lot of restoration work 
um, that was done in this area in the past. And one of the main reasons I think was because of the polluted condition of uh, the Connemaw River and Blacklick Creek. Uh, this is a map of the uh, uh, Kiski Connemaw River Basin from 1999. It shows uh, AMD affected streams as being red and the area that we're interested in is right, right in the center of it. Um, So this has actually changed, uh, you know, the water quality of the Kanawha River has improved quite a bit in the last 15 years. Uh, there's been a lot of passive treatment systems that have been constructed. And uh, I guess most importantly, the, the St. Michael Active Treatment Plant went online in 2013 on the Little Kanawha River. And this is a picture of the plant. And prior to uh, treatment, this is what the stream looked like. And, and this is what it looks like now. So we are getting, you know, some better water quality in the Connemaw River. So it makes sense to to start looking at some of these other other areas. Um, you know, these are. So I, I focus my efforts on on the streams that flow into the Connemaw because that that's what was shown to me. That's what they're most interested in in dealing with. And uh, yeah, there are three three different streams, uh, Richard's Run, which is broken up into the West Branch and East Branch, and also um, Roaring Run, which is on the Western side, and uh, a large part of it is state game land. And then this unnamed tributary that, that comes up the middle. And I'm calling it unnamed tributary E, and I'm naming that after uh, a coal mine uh, permit application that uh, I was able to find. And uh, I, I I guess I really didn't really know what I was getting myself into with working on this uh, project here. Uh, so when I when I begin a new assessment project, I always look for existing data, and you know this is a map of the the surface mines, um, the historic surface mines in, in in the area, and you know I also I, I look for um, data from the DEP, uh, watershed organization. Uh, I look at the underground mine maps. I talk, talk to locals, and I, I found out that um, this mine right here um, it was actually uh, still active. This is called the Wheatfield Operation, and it was operated by uh, River Hill uh, Coal Company. And I just want to stress that you know these um, mine permit applications are excellent sources of information. Um, they actually conduct a very thorough hydrologic analysis of the area in order to get their permits. So not too long ago, uh, to get this permit data, you'd have to go to their office and, and sort through the permit application and all the subsequent um, you know, paperwork. And you know, there could be you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of, of documents that you'd have to go through. And yeah, a lot of those um permits have been scanned now and you know so you just have to give them a call which is what i did uh, this permit was issued in 2004 and you know they they did a a very thorough hydrologic analysis and i have never seen a permit application quite like this but this this is uh all the different sample points that they collected during this this uh this study and there were over 360 sample points, and they were broken down into um, background sample points, which were uh, two samples, you know, uh, prior to mining, and they weren't directly associated with with the the mining, and then uh, monitoring points, which are six samples during mining, or I'm sorry, six samples um, prior to mining, and then quarterly thereafter. So um, one of the things that they, they want to look for are uh, existing sources of, of pollution because they don't want to be held responsible for it. And in Pennsylvania, we have something called subchapter F points, which is named after the, uh, I guess, the, the section of the code uh, the, of regulation. And it allows you to identify existing um, sources of AMD you know, so that you're not held responsible later on. 
So the, the mining company was originally going to mine this entire area, which is, would have uh, basically cleaned up everything. There's some alkalinity and the overburden, and it would have neutralized the you know, acid producing materials. And you know, I wouldn't have to be doing anything actually. Um, but unfortunately, they were only able to mine a, a few small areas. Um, I think there's one area up in here and then an area over here. And the coal market went sour and you know, I guess they couldn't make a profit. And so they, they stopped mining. Um, so now we have, you know, you know, we have to deal with, you know, all these sources of pollution, um, but we have lots and lots of data, which is they're probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I was given uh, some of the more recent data in, in Excel, uh, but there is also just reams of, of data that was scanned and you know, I've had to digitize. So after um, putting it all together, um, I created this master table of sample points and you know that's how I was able to create the the map of you know all the all the different sample point locations. Um, so I, I added details uh, such as the maximum flow rate, the the pH, uh, the minimum pH that that was in the data set, um, whether or not it was a subchapter F point, and whether or not it was a stream. So I was able to create this GIS map um, based on that that table. And you know they had uh, 30 different stream sample points, and then I classified those stream sample points uh, by the pH, which is which is crude, but gives you an idea of of what kind of quality um, you're going to have in that section of the stream. And you can see upstream the the quality is actually pretty good. You know, pretty much every upstream point is um, above a six, and yeah, you know, the as you go down into the valley, you know, towards the mouth is is where it's picking up a lot of the the discharges. So I did the same thing for all the discharges, springs, and wells that were sampled during this um, study, and so this is you can see that the eastern side of the of the permanent area um, seems pretty good, uh, but if you go right down the center, center part of this valley here and unnamed tributary E, um, that's that's the worst part. And I, I'm beginning to think that they they name unnamed tributary E for evil because of just the amount of uh, discharges that that are in that that valley. And I, I'd be afraid to just dig a hole. Um, you know, you just have bad water spewing out of it. Like it 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 is really, really bad. So I was able to, uh, with the data that I, I have, um, I, I didn't go through all the historic data that was about 25 years old, but I tried to use you know, the more recent data. Uh, I was able to select the top 10 discharges um, based on loading. So here, here they are uh, shown on the map. Um, WF-337 uh, was the, the biggest discharge, and WF-332 uh, was, was the next biggest. And you can see that the amount of loading in, in this, uh, these two discharges is just incredible. Uh, this is kind of off the charts for, um, for discharges. Now, this is another way to look at it. Um, I did a, a top 10, but uh, actually it was a top 11 uh, for the watershed. I, I kept on WF111 because uh, when I looked at the older data, it actually would have been one of the top five discharges, but the flow rate has gone way down. So I, I want to definitely look at that um, when we get to our, our sampling here. So you can see the how, how bad uh, WF337 and 332 are in comparison. Um, yeah, I I definitely do want to do some additional sampling here, um, verify um, you know the flows and and the quality. I the 
all the water quality, you know, for these permits, they're required to go to, um, you know, certified lab. So I think the water quality is going to be pretty good, but, you know, I just don't, definitely want to double check some of the flows. Uh, so I, as far as future work, yeah, you know, I want to sort through some of the remaining uh, discharge data. I want to look through and, um, you know, pull out the the sites that are over uh, 10 gallons a minute with a pH less than five. That'll allow me to, um, I guess, narrow it down um, to sites that, that could be potentially bad. And um, also, uh, I, you know, I want to do some sampling because after 25 years, you know, some of those, you know, background samples, you know, if it was, yeah, you know, there could be some some real changes to the quality of the water, uh, especially if it was related to surface mining. Uh, not so much with with underground mining. Those discharges tend to be pretty constant for a very long period of time. You know, even hundreds of years I, is what I've heard. Um, but yeah, you know, I want to do some sampling here. Uh, we're going to look at the upstream and downstream uh, sections of the streams again, and also um, look at all the the top ten discharges. And I just wanted to leave you here with, uh, this is the, the WF332. Uh, it doesn't look like much. Uh, it only flows about 20 gallons a minute. Um, but at times, uh, the water quality has a, you know, the maximum values that we had for iron was around 2,500 2, milligrams per liter. Aluminum was 600 milligrams per liter. And the max acidity was 8,500 milligrams per liter. So this is, this is what caused the, the giant plume in the Connemaw River here. You know, there really isn't too many other sources in, on Richard's run. But I think that's about all I have. Um, you know, if you, um, yeah, thank you for, for listening to what I had to say. And, you know, if anyone has any questions, I'd uh, be happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions in the chat. So how many samples did you take per, per seep discharge point? So we actually have not done our sampling yet. Um, I've been sorting through all this data um, and it's been taking me longer than I, I wanted. So. Yeah, we're going to take uh, two high flow samples and and compare that against uh, the data that we have in this robust database that we have now from all the the mine permit data. Awesome, thank you. Hey, another question: Do you have any thoughts on suitable remediation options? Uh, Melissa doesn't recall the mine pool map. Is it possible to pull directly from the mine pool to treat? I have, I have not gotten to uh, looking at the mine pool. Um, there are some existing mine pools that are being treated uh, by the mi active, mi uh, active treatment plant. Um, I think some of these smaller uh, discharges might be suitable for for passive treatment, um, yeah, I think I think the the flows are are going to change some in comparison to what they measured. Um, just looking at the data, yeah, I think a lot of the the sites actually would probably be suitable for for passive treatment. Perfect. Okay, uh, next question. Were O and M costs considered for the feasibility study? I think that's going to have to be uh, a next step. Um, we only had a, a very little bit of, of funding for this project, and yeah, now that we know what's out there, um, you know, we're definitely going to verify things. But you know, we're going to seek additional funds to um, put together conceptual 
uh, design and you know, consider the, the overhead costs associated with that. Perfect. That's all of the questions that we have right now in the chat. Thank you again so much for your presentation, Sean. And back to Rachel for our next introduction. Thanks, Sean. It was really nice to see all of that data. That's um, a really uh, bad seep. Uh, so our next presentation will be a research spotlight from one of our three RQ university partners, Bus Liberty University, and they'll be presenting on carbon breakdown in AMD streams. Uh, Catherine Cutlip, a graduate student, will be giving the presentation, but uh, we also have James Wood on the call. So thank you both. Hi, give me one second to just get this into the proper view and then I will share it with you. Um, okay. I guess I have to share my screen with you first. There's too much stuff in it to get through. Okay. Okay. So I am <clears throat> in my last semester of my graduate program right now. Um, and I have been studying the effects of mine drainage um, on the local ecosystems here um, where we live. So the impacts of it being the mine drainage on freshwater ecosystems. Um, so mine drainage for anybody who's unfamiliar is water that is polluted from contact with mining activity and normally associated with coal mining. Um, obviously we live in West Virginia, so there's a lot of coal mining around. Um, this particular picture is part of the, the creek that I am studying. This is the, the mine drainage output. So the purpose of my experiment was to determine how the addition of mine drainage was impacting rates of decomposition of organic materials, as well as how it was in, uh, impacting the microbial communities, which are integral in the decomposition of organic materials in the creek beds. Um, and this is two of my site locations. Um, the creek that I'm studying has AMD part way down. So I can compare above where the AMD is to below where the AMD is. So the creek is called Glen's Run. Uh, we know that this is the AMD input down here. This is a picture I took. So this is halfway down the length of the creek. Um, you can see over here, this is a breakdown of the watersheds in our area. This is all part of the upper Ohio South watershed. And Glen's Run is this little orange one here. And here is an aerial view that just sort of gives you a better idea of what we're looking at. Um, we have a fairly large long wall mining area up here, um, Tunnel Ridge. We already know that Glen's Run has impairments from aluminum, iron, manganese, as well as pH issues. And we have additional stressors for metal toxicity um, with aluminum, flocculation, sedimentation with iron, and then pH toxicity. This is just a better aerial view so you can see where my locations are. So I've got five locations total. Um, I've got two above the mine drainage and then three below the mine drainage. Everything is equidistant. So hundred meters above the mine drainage input, 10 meters above the mine drainage input. And then we've got the mine drainage um, 10 meters below, hundred meters below. And I have an outlier here that's about 1300 meters below the mine drainage down here. And then this is the Ohio River. So you can kind of see up here just a little bit better. They're, they're equally distant um, apart. And you can just sort of see this red one here is the mine drainage in the middle. That's the, the, the input from the tube. So in order to go ahead and run this experiment, um, one of the main things I did was I created these arrays. So they're pieces of plastic gutter. Uh, we've taken PVC tubing and glass slides along with cellular sponges and wooden veneers. Um, and we've created this enclosure 
it's got screening over top of it to help keep out insects so that we can determine how much of the breakdown of the materials is due to uh, microbial breakdown as opposed to having you know uh, macroinvertebrates breaking down leaf litter and such. And this is just sort of like the process of what I went through to, to create it. Um, all of the substrates were two and a half centimeters squared. They're all the same size. And the way that the arrays were placed into the stream was so that this part up here, which is the top, was placed so the flow went straight through the bottom. So all of the substrates were receiving equal amounts of water from the stream where they were sitting. Uh, they were adhered to the bottom of the creek bed using rebar and uh, zip ties. They were put out for a total of six weeks. At the end of six weeks, we went ahead and retrieved them and took them back to the lab. Um, you can see visually there's already a pretty apparent differences in the breakdown of these cellulose sponges. So this is site one. This is 100 meters above the mine drainage input. And this is site five. This is my outlier site, the furthest one away. Um, it is also the one that has the most recovery. So Iman, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more details, but so just imagine, you know, sites three and four, which are significantly closer to the mine drainage input um, and how that affects the decomposition rates. Once I had all of my substrates pulled out of my arrays um, and they were all pre-weighed and numbered, I knew which one was in exactly which location in each array. Um, we numbered all of them. We dried them before they went into the creek and then I weighed them. I wrote down the weight after the six weeks, I took them out, I dried them again, I weighed them again and then we put them in a muffle furnace and ash them, which is what these photos are. So this is the remaining result of a cellulose sponge after six weeks in the creek, and this is a wooden veneer. And, and then we did lots of math and stats, which are hard when you're using R. And we came up with some information um, as far as the breakdown rates of the sponges and the veneers. So this is particularly for the sponges. Uh, your flow is from site one down to site five. Um, the AMD input here, that is, that's zero meters. That's what we're calling zero. And the way that these box and whisker plots work um, is this is sort of your, your average, your normal span of result in how many grams per day we're losing. This line here marks the average total. And then at the end here, we have um, your outliers. So there could be reasons as to why we have, you know, one or two that stick out further than the rest of them. But your overall picture shows you that as we get to the mine drainage input, decomposition basically stops for the sponges. It's, it's not zero, but it's pretty close. Um, site four is a bit better. Site five, again, is really bad. Now, the outlying site, there is a fairly large roadway for our area right there. So there could be some contributing factors as far as to why the decomposition rate drops back down again. Um, I'm still in the process of, of putting all of that information together. Uh, the veneers you can see also decrease in their ability to decompose. Um, it's a little bit different. It looks like site four has a larger <clears throat> de decrease in functionality compared to site three, which is not what we saw with the sponges. The sponges had a significant impact right at three, got a little bit better at four. Site five, which is the outlier, the box plot is larger, so we have a larger variation happening there, but the overall average decomposition rate is still slower. Um, so I went ahead and put together a site comparison um, just so you can sort of see a better idea of what the difference in the breakdown is. So for site one compared to site two, Site one is 
0.57 times faster than site two for the breakdown in sponges. Um, and it's 0.71 times slower for the rate of veneers. Not particularly sure why at this point, um, but if when you get down to site one compared to site five, site one for sponges decomposes 16.5 times faster than the sponges at site five. And that's pretty impressive. Um, so that's sort of how this is meant to be read. The veneers are being processed slower at site five than at site one. Again, I think that there's going to be some additional information as far as water chemistry and microbial composition that's at play here. Um, but the overall picture is that as you add in the mine drainage, the ability for the stream to break down organic materials is compromised. I also went ahead and took a subset of these um, substrates from each ray and I used them to isolate bacterial and um, fungal DNA, which I'm sending out for third-party analysis at this point. I have not had the results sent back yet. I did use the Kaijin DNA Easy Power Biofilm Kit and Zymo will be doing the sequencing. Um, so right now what I can tell you is the DNA that I got out of the stream system um, is a bit degraded anyway, which is not uncommon when you're dealing with environmental DNA. This is a picture of the gel that I ran. So once I was done isolating all of my DNA, I was able to run a gel just to see if I did have DNA in my samples. You know, was my power biofilm kit um, successful in isolating any of that information? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, initially, I was kind of upset because I wasn't happy with the results that I got here. But when I started to really break it down, I realized that some of this uh, lack of, of DNA is, is data in and of itself. So over here, I try to make this easier to understand. The purple is the location. So we've got array one, array two, which are both above the mine drainage, array three, array four, and array five. The first three lanes are sponges. The second three lanes are veneers. And then you have sponges and then veneers. And then this first one here on the left side of the green line, that's the ladder. So that's just a, a way to determine how many base pairs I'm looking at. So what you see really is that for arrays one and two, we do have DNA. It might be degraded, but it's there. Once you get to array three and four, it significantly drops off. I mean, you almost see very little to nothing in most of these lanes, and it doesn't start to pick back up again in any way noticeable until the outlier site location number five. So though I'm still waiting for the microbial data to come back with sequencing, so I know exactly what is um, growing in these different places, the fact that, you know, I can already see that they are being negatively impacted by the mine drainage is, is pretty interesting. I also went ahead and did water chemistry. So when I put the, the arrays into the creek bed, we did a water grab, which we sent out for third party analysis through Duquesne. Um, and that was, um, measured for cations and anions which gives an, us an idea about like dissolved metals in the water as well as sulfites, nitrates, phosphates, um, those kinds of things. And I did weekly water chemistry readings. So every week I went out and made sure that the arrays were still in the creek bed. I cleared any sort of debris that was on top or made sure that there wasn't any obstruction to water flow. And then I measured the pH, the temperature, dissolved oxygen, specific conductivity, turbidity and chloride using the YSI meter. And what I found <clears throat> was specifically conductivity is a problem, which, you know, if you know most anything about mind drainage, you know that that's going to be an issue. So you can see, you can see the mind drainage, which I took water readings on as well. Um, the, the average weekly output for conductivity was 8,709. And sites three, four, and five are still significantly impacted by that. 
Whereas you look at sites one and two and you're at less than a thousand. So that's pretty significant. Temperature didn't fluctuate too badly, even though the mine drainage itself is pretty cold coming out of the hillside. Um, dissolved oxygen wasn't horribly impacted. Um, pH, we did have a, a minimal drop in pH. The, the mine drainage itself is very acidic, but between, you know, with, with the type of rock we have in the area, I'm not too surprised to see it bounce back up. We have a lot of calcium here. Um, chloride, there was an increase in that until site five and then turbidity. So the amount of turbidity coming out of the mine itself wasn't super bad. Um, there was an increase in sites three and four. Site five is very high. I'm going to say that probably has more to do with roadway runoff at this point. The cation and anion analysis, um, we had a high readings of nitrates and sulfates at the locations. Um, and then the dissolved metals that came back as being problematic were aluminum, manganese, iron, and arsenic. Um, and we already know that aluminum and iron were going to be an issue. Manganese is pretty, pretty common as far as mine drainage is concerned. So that wasn't too surprising. I was pretty interested in the arsenic reading though, because my arsenic was actually higher prior to the mine drainage than below the mine drainage. Uh, the mine drainage itself did not have very much arsenic in it at all. Um, so we'll come to find out that uh, iron is one of the ways that they, I guess it's oxidized iron, is, is a way to remediate um, arsenic. So that would explain why some of my, my levels below the mine drainage were pretty much nil. But overall, the impact is ongoing. Um, you can see, you know, here's, here's where Glens Run dumps out into the Ohio River. Um, and this is actually pretty minimal. I've had other aerial shots that I wish I had access to right now where you can really see um, significant um, effluent of, of mine drainage coming into the Ohio. And it's just getting washed downstream. This is obviously a problem through a good portion of the state. So at this point in my experiment, what I can tell you is that the functionality of the stream is significantly decreased. Um, and that is gonna be impacted by the microbial communities um, and the pollutants. So certain fungi are gonna be more, aquatic fungi and terrestrial fungi are not, they don't operate the same. Um, and where terrestrial fungi can be very tolerant to certain pollutants, microbial, I'm sorry, uh, aquatic fungi are more susceptible to metal toxicity. So once I get my results back from my um, DNA sequencing, I'll have a better idea of what's happening between the microbial community, specifically the fungi and the ability for the creek to break down organic matter. Um, which is really important. Uh, freshwater ecosystems are a large part of our ability to break down carbon, sequester it, and then release it back into the atmosphere. Um, and then, you know, additionally, we're having these pollutants that are transferred into additional waterways, and it's it just becomes a cumulative problem. So that's sort of where I'm at at this point. I wish I had a little bit more to offer you. I think that once the microbial information comes back, I will be able to, you know, relate that to the chemistry of the water and the functionality a bit more. But in the meantime, I thank you for joining and for listening to what it was I did have to share. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer to the best of my abilities. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, that was great. Uh, we've got several questions in the chat for you. Okay. Was the microbial composition slash breakdown examined within the mine drainage itself? No. So because the tube is literally coming out of the hillside, there isn't any, there isn't any organic matter in the, in the tube and the water fluctuates too much to attach it array somehow. Um, there's no way to easily, I guess, monitor how that water specifically is impacting within the tube, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. 
All right, next question for breakdown calculations. Did you consider the rate to be linear or exponential? So we did break it down to a linear rate of decay. So it's based on um, a daily loss over time as opposed to um, exponential. Perfect. Is there any data on effects of decomp of any sites that have both MD and coliform? We unfortunately so had a fish hole in and we're questioning age of decomp with CSO and AMD pollution factors in the watershed. So we have a lot of um, fecal coliform issues up here, specifically E. coli, um, which my lab mate, I think, spoke to you um, in January about. And one of the problems with having, <laughs> I guess you wouldn't, usually consider this a problem, but having mine drainage that doesn't have a significant drop in pH is that it allows those uh, fecal coliform communities to flourish as well. So you end up with mine drainage that's circumneutral, and then you have, you know, fecal coliform living happily beside it. So I don't know of any papers that have um, studied, you know, the rate of decomposition, including AMD and fecal coliform. I think it's an interesting, it's interesting. And I, I don't know offhand if it has any impact. Um, but I do know that, you know, our creeks up here do have significant E. coli and fecal coliform issues. So my creek is probably one of those creeks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just two more. How were the DNA analysis funded? How is the DNA analysis funded? Um, I have a, a grant that I received um, and I've been able to use some of the grant money um, through uh, the West Virginia NASA program to pay for it. Um, I am capable of doing it myself in the lab. Um, I have done it before, but at this point with the additional thesis work I'm doing, um, it's just easier to have a lab do it for me. Absolutely. All right. Last question. In the six weeks when your samples were in the creek, how much did the flows change? We did not measure water flow on a weekly basis. Um, I will say that the positioning of the arrays in the creek bed, they were never dry. They were set into areas which had consistent flow, um, but were on the deeper ends of the creek bed so as to prevent um, any sort of drying out. Well, thank you again so much, Catherine. Gonna turn things back over to Rachel to introduce our third and final speaker for today. Thanks, Catherine. Great job. Our last presentation, we're going to shine a light on Friends of Deckers Creek, one of our watershed groups uh, located near Morgantown. And they're going to be talking about their uh, AMD remediation projects. So we'll be hearing from Brian Hurley, the executive director. Hello, thank you so much for uh, giving me this time here. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, uh, seamlessly share my screen, but I'm not off to a great start. <laughs> I, it's funny before when I kind of did some practice with this and then it, and I had it, there it is, share screen, got it. And that's what I'm looking for. And share and okay. Do it live. Okay. All right. And okay. So. I am, so yeah, I'm Brian Hurley uh, from Friends of De Decker's Creek and gonna talk to you a little bit about the, our treatment projects that we have uh, right now. And it doesn't, why is it not? There it is, okay, I was pushing the wrong button. So I'm uh, Brian, just a brief introduction. So I'm the uh, director at Friends of Decker's Creek. Um, and Friends of Decker's Creek, we primarily talk about abandoned mine lands or focus on abandoned mine lands. 
Previously, I was a field technician at Friends of the Cheat. Um, and when I was there, I looked at special rec sites and a, a little bit more, more about that uh, in a little bit later. Sean, uh, Sean spoke. Uh, mentioned that a little bit. So I'm going to mention that a little bit. So hard to believe that I've actually been an operator for nine years now, which is just really wild for me to wrap my mind around. Um, so you know, you folks know what acid mine drainage is. Um, we talked about the uh, water quality and kind of the, the, the parameters that, that we look for. I know you folks are, are uh, familiar with this. Um, and so we don't need to talk about that. And so we're going to so the biggest offender in the Decker's Creek watershed is the uh, Richard Mine. And um, right on the right of the screen, you can see the uh, white uh, aluminum and the orange iron. And much like Catherine's uh, Creek, um, it's a pretty similar colors. Um, and the biggest uh, dissolved metals we deal with in, in the watershed are uh, iron and aluminum and man man manganese. Um, and you can see how many pounds of uh, those dissolved metals we get a year from this particular mine only. So um, kind of going back to uh, baseline for the wa wa water quality, and we like to see 6.5 to 8 pH. Um, and you can see that uh, conductivity and pH changes up and down with the slides. So you folks are, are all familiar with this, but just kind of set the stage. So here on the left of the screen, we have the uh, Decker's Creek watershed in the light blue, and all of the red items are the all the mining around, and most of that is underground mining. And so this one right here, can you see my pointer or can you not see my pointer? Okay, I don't have that. Uh, I haven't uh, clicked on the thing that makes my pointer that cool red red laser. But at any rate, so here, this big uh, underground scene, this is the Richard Mine, which is what we saw one or two slides, slides ago, which is the biggest remaining polluter in the, the Decker's Creek watershed. Um, so I front loaded uh, a little bit about the um, the uh, abandoned mine land compared to special rec sites. So the the in brief, um, Surface Mining Control Reclamation Act was uh, passed in 1977, and so that means anything that any mine that closed before 1977, no one is 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 liable to to reclaim it. Any mine that was closed after 1977, uh, the coal mining operators are obligated to 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 re reclaim it. Um, I was glad to see in Sean's presentation that the coal mine operators uh, were indeed reclaiming and treating the water, um, but that's not always the case. Um, so that's when we have the uh, that's where the where the special rec comes in. So that was uh, special re reclamation is a mine closed in 1977 that the mine operator did not reclaim, clean up the water. Um, and before 1977 is considered abandoned mine landed, abandoned mine lands, and no one is obligated to clean up. So that's where groups like Friends of De Decker's Creek step in. Um, so this is some very, very charismatic pictures of acid mine drainage. Um, on the left, we have a tree uh, doing some maintenance on a treatment site. And on the right is just some raw acid mine drainage flowing into the creek. So we kind of have two umbrellas of our treatment systems. We got passive sites and we got active sites. Um, and the passive sites are lower cost, lower maintenance. Um, you get uh, effective treatment and you don't have to deal with the power source. Um, I, I have noticed that the, uh, I forgot to add this, that their um, quality of treatment tends to degrade over time as the treatment measures get, get er er eroded out. Um, and so then the other umbrella is the active site. And so this we have our, it's the active site, we need a power source. And um, you do get a consistent treatment over the system's lifespan, but it's there's a lot more maintenance, a, a lot more costs and uh, power source. So those are kind of like the just the basics, ba basics to kind of to set the stage. 
So here is one of the Friends of Debt Decker's Creek uh, active site, or sorry, passive sites. Um, and the coal, the acid mine drainage is collected along this uh, old high wall, um, goes into that first pond, second pond, third pond, fourth pond, fifth pond. And at the end of that, you're, you're getting good, 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 good water, uh, good water quality. Um, notice there's no doser or there's no silo or anything like that. So then we have our active site, uh, one of our active sites. So here we have the water is coming in from right behind th this picture here. It's going through the treatment system and into our settling pond. And if you were to open the door there to the silo, you're going to see this particular silo, which is a t t tipping bucket that uh, delivers a dose of lime to get the treatment system. So that's enough background. Um, and as you, um, and the biggest thing that we want to talk about is this stuff works. Um, on the left of the screen, we've got Decker's Creek 1995. I want to point out the red, the red rocks. Those are all stained by acid mine drainage. And then, did I say, I meant on the left. Did I say left? I meant left. 1995 red, red rocks. And then on the right, we have rock co colored rocks. And this stretch of De Decker's Creek is actually qu quite healthy. Um, that is, it is healthy because of all, all of the work that Friends of Decker's Creek and uh, rec reclamation groups and uh, people and coal mining operators who do clean, clean up their, their, their water quality. So combined, uh, combined, we get our benefit of rock colored rocks instead of red colored rocks, as well as all the water quality improvements that come with it, which you folks are familiar with. So now to kind of drill into, um, uh, run low on time here. So to drill into the most recent system, uh, Dillon Creek, this is a uh, passive system that, that we recently put together. Um, and this is the engineering blueprints. We have the primary seep coming in, the North seep um, going into our uh, treatments. Here is a limestone bed where we're getting our, our treatment system and treat our, our acid miner is treating rather with the pH improvement and we're settling metals out. Um, so this is the blueprint and we recently, this is the site under construction. Um, we are looking down into where the uh, limestone bed is going to be eventually be built. And after construction, we ended up with this. The, so this is the completed Dillon Creek treatment system. So this is our north seep collector, our south seep, seep collector. So the water goes in, goes through this limestone bed. It gets its pH improved, and then it is discharged into this uh, artificial wetland, this constructed wet wetland into good water quality treatment. Um, so kind of what I really want to talk about here is the things that we had to deal with in order to get this project built, uh, which I think is what, um, yeah, so this is the biggest things that Friends of De 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 Decker's Creek face while putting this construction project in. Um, land the, we changed the, the, the landowners. And so these are all obstacles that we had to overcome. Um, so change the, the landowners, but the landowners, so we have everything set up. Um, then the landowners sold, sold their land, but we didn't have sufficient documentation in the courthouse. So the lesson here is to make sure when you're building a treatment system to put all of your, uh, books documented at the courthouse. So if the landowner changes your uh, permission to en enter and build the construction site stays, uh, stays true. Um, the other big delay we had was our permit approval timeline. Um, so this was a grant funded project and we, our grant was a four year timeline. Um, but our permit, we had a pretty quick turnaround with our, uh, per permit approval, but it was still 10 or 12 months. I can't recall specifically. So when you're trying to put a project together, make sure that you have a, a lot of time for the for the, the permitting to, to go through Army Corps of Engineers, stormwater permit, um, historical pr preservation permit, all, all, all the permits. Um, permit action is we ran into a headache with 
by the by the we had to cut down the trees before March ended uh, in order for us to build the unless for it to be delayed until no November because of bats. Um, so we take a really, really long time for the permits to get approved. And then when the permit does approve, we had like two weeks to start putting our permit in action. And we were scrambling there, but but we we, we got it done. So once again, realistic timelines. Um, the uh, grant when we wrote the when we wrote the grant, this was four or five years years ago with very out 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 outdated equipment to estimate the cost of AMD treatments. So when you're building a treatment, make sure you add con contingency into your budget. So that means the estimated costs over the long time, make sure you, you, you compensate for the increase of uh, pay, pay, pay raises, increase of equipment, increase rates of fuel, all that stuff. Um, the other thing we had was a bit of an ambiguous engineering contract. Um, and this one was the engineer um, designed the designed the designed the, the the project, but there was no information to actually send out to 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 the to 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 the contractor. So that was there was no contracting packet to send out when we we're doing our contract bids. So make sure with the engineering contract to have the scope of work outlined uh, specifically. All all cross all all of your T's and dot all of your I's with that. And then we also had project re redesigns, which uh, delayed us even further. Um, but the good news is, despite all these, the treatment still worked. Um, this is our system in, 295, system out, pH 2, uh, 6.74. So we're seeing really impressive improvements of the, of the w water quality here. Um, and so... Kind of like the issues that we face were mostly time t t t timelines and per per permitting. Um, but so when you're implementing a project, make sure you plan ahead for for those things. Um, I kind of scrambled and raced through that because uh, running low on time. But that's uh, kind of an overview about the a few of the um, parts of building a treatment system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. And mm. I'm very impressed with you were able to get everything done right by 11. We do have one question for you. Oh, Becca, I think you're muted. Are there any? Gosh. I'm hearing and... you, Becca. Okay. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Can other people hear me? Yeah. I see some nods, so I'm going to uh, anyway. go forward with <laughs> So, any provisions made for maintenance slash renewal of the passive schemes, such as removal of sludge or renewal of limestone? Mm, okay, so passive schemes, let's see here, uh, provisions made for maintenance removal passive. So we do our best to to complete the, the, the project while still allowing time for like maintenance and sampling. However, more often than I than I care to to acknowledge, everything gets pushed up against the like end of the grant timeline, um, and we can't really do the maintenance that 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 is needed. However, the West Virginia DEP has a new um, branch, maybe in the last few few years, where there's a uh, collection of funds to be used to maintenance and upkeep on on abandoned mine, mine land site as well as the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, they're able to, to build up maintenance funds for that. Um, so that is part of um, the, uh, so we try to, 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 to bake, 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 bake in, uh, we want to bake in maintenance, we try to bake in it, uh, but as in, but in practice, it's we often, our uh, grant timeline runs out before we can do appropriate maintenance. Awesome, thank you. And one more question. What is the anticipated longevity of the system? So the systems, we generate the, uh, design the system for a lifespan of um, 15 to, to, to 20 years is is kind of the, uh, is in the, the, the standard. Um, once again, in, in, pra in practicality, um, it doesn't, 
Um, you, you get really, really good, good treatment when the system is first built. Um, but it's kind of a, but over the times, like the first five, five years, you're going to have a significant drop, drop in pH. And then the next three years, you're going to have a moderate drop in pH. And then the last few years, the remaining years of the line line year, uh, the project lifespan, you're barely get, get, getting any, um, a pH improvement. And that's just kind of gen general other, other, uh, treatment system have had d d different results, but that's, uh, seems to be, uh, how it pans out.